Good evening, everyone, uh, and uh, uh, thank you for being here for the Raquel Rubio Goldsmith Lecture in Ethnic, Gender, and Global Studies. My name is David Doré, and I'm the president of the downtown and the northwest campuses of Pima, and I am just so excited about uh, tonight's wonderful event, and it's a great honor to welcome you to our campus. Uh, I'm looking forward to the lecture and our conversation. Uh, but before we get started, I just want to acknowledge a, a, a few of our uh, honored guests that are here. I'd like to acknowledge our board chair of the Board of Governors, Mark Hanna, who is with us this evening. I'd also like to acknowledge Martha Durkin, uh, a member of our Board of Governors who is with us this evening. And I'd like to acknowledge my colleague, uh, Dr. Lorraine Morales, president of the uh, East Campus and the Community Campus. And I'm going to introduce her a little later, but I'd also like to acknowledge our provost and executive vice chancellor, Dr. Dolores Duran Serta, who's with us this evening. And I sa saved him for last because it is now uh, my honor, before we get started, to introduce the Chancellor of Pima Community College, Lee Lambert. And, and I'd, I, uh, before Lee comes up here, I'd also like to know that you don't need to stand if you, we have two overflow rooms, uh, but if you would like to go up to C C254, you can watch this in there as well if you get tired standing. Good evening, everybody. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good evening. Um, David, thank you for, for introducing me, and thank you all for coming out. We are so excited at Pima Community College that we are in the process of launching an ethnic studies department. We're still in the evolution, so we're very proud. We're making progress in that direction. <laughs> but but let, me talk, let me talk about why this is important. First of all, our nation's community colleges across our fine country, we are institutions of social justice. And to be an institution of social justice and not have an ethnic studies department, I think, is a travesty. And as the chancellor of this community college, it is important that I make sure that we move in this direction. And that's why we're moving in this direction. But let me give you some context. Because I think, why do we have an ethnic studies department? And and part of that is, when you look at the history of our great nation, it is not rooted in a lot of positive events and how it's treated people of color and women and others of differences in this country. And you can go back many ways. You can go back to the Black Codes. You can go back to Operation Out, uh, Wetback. You can go back to the Chinese Exclusion Acts. Uh, you can go back to the Trails of Tears, and you can see that we must educate and inform our citizens and residents of the history of this country and how it has evolved. But also we have to recognize we still have a lot of work to do. If you look at educational attainment today, especially for African Americans and Latino Latinas, it's lagging significantly behind uh, our white students and our Asian students. If we don't sew up that pipeline, it's gonna make it difficult for the next generation to have teachers in the classroom that look like themselves. I mean, this is critical. And so I think it's very important that, that as an institution of higher education, we make sure that we play our role in this. And I wanna share with you just what a definition from the UC Berkeley, because the University of California Berkeley was one of the pioneers in ethnic studies. And let me read to you what they say about ethnic studies. Ethnic studies is the critical and interdisciplinary study of race, ethnicity, and indigeneity, with a focus on the experiences and perspectives of people of color within and beyond the United States, because there is a global connection to how people of color have been treated in the United States of America. Since the emergence of ethnic studies as an academic field in the late 60s, Scholars have analyzed the ways in which race and racism have been and continue to be powerful social, cultural, and political forces and their connections to other axes of stratification, including gender, class, sexuality, and legal status. Let me close with saying something about gender. 
I think most of you know that, that October is Domestic Violence Month, and today is considered Domestic Violence Day, and that's why you see some of us wearing purple. But let me say a little something about domestic violence. One in every three persons in the United States will be impacted by domestic violence. Over three million of our kids every year are exposed to domestic violence. Disproportionately, women of color are, are raped and mistreated in sexual ways. This is a real issue for us in this nation and in this community. I think it's important that we, as a community college, make sure we continue to educate about differences, not to divide, but to bring people together. So I'm so proud that Pima is now leading the way in this community around ethnic studies. I'm so grateful we can start by having this wonderful lecture this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chancellor Lambert. So this evening, Pima Community College presents the inaugural Raquel Rubio Goldsmith Lecture in Ethnic, Gender, and Global Studies. We are very grateful to have Professor Rubio Goldsmith with us to honor her and participate in this evening's event. A, a mother of ethnic studies, Rubio Goldsmith is also a founding faculty member of Pima Community College where she began teaching in 1970 and created the first courses in Mexican American, Native American, and African American studies. A native of Douglas, Arizona, she completed undergraduate and graduate degrees in law and philosophy at the National Autonomous University of Mexico, UNAM. Since 1983, she has taught at the University of Arizona and is co-director of its Binational Migration Institute. Winning numerous awards for teaching excellence, Rubio Goldsmith's primary focus has been the history of Mexicanas and Chicanas, particularly in the U.S.-Mexico border context, while also teaching Mexican and Latin American history. Rubio Goldsmith authored and co-edited some of the first publications on Chicana and Mexicana history. She also specializes in immigration and human rights and has presented her research at national and international conferences. Recently, she edited Migrant Deaths in the Desert, La Vida No Vale Nada just published by the University of Arizona Press. The book addresses the tragic results of government policies on immigration, a topic on which she has written a number of papers and policy reports. Students and colleagues know Raquel as a kind and generous mentor and friend to many at Pima and the University of Arizona and elsewhere. She is also known as a devoted community activist in 1994, she was a member of the Chicano-Chicana delegation to the Convención Constitucional Zapatista and on the board of the Comisión Nacional de Solidaridad Zapatista. Currently, she is a member of the Coalición de Derechos Humanos Fundación México and the Board of Little Chapel of All Nations, participating in numerous community activities that support education, women's rights, and migrants and human rights. We name this evening's lecture after Raquel Rubio Goldsmith to honor and thank her for her life's work. Making her the namesake of this event also highlights the college's renewed commitment to ethnic and gender studies and calls us to further the legacy to which she and many of her generation gave birth in order to nurture us and give us strength in our collective struggle for knowledge, social justice, and a peaceful world. And it is now my pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Dolores Duran Serta, our Provost and Executive Vice Chancellor, who will introduce our keynote speaker and moderate the dialogue to follow. Thank you, David. Buenas tardes y bienvenidos. Good evening and welcome. Our event tonight is a blend between a traditional academic lecture and a dialogue among our special panelists. This format was suggested to us by Dr. Rosalba Aida Hernandez Castillo herself. 
and we are excited by the possibility of an intergenerational conversation about her work and the opportunity for our students to be a part of this dialogue. We will begin with a brief lecture by Dr. Hernandez Castillo, followed by a discussion among her, Dr. Raquel Rubio Goldsmith, and two students from Ethnic Gender and Global Studies, Watona Shorty and Madeline Anderson. Born in Ensenada, Baja California, Dr. Rosalba Ida Hernandez Castillo earned her doctorate in anthropology from Stanford University in 1996. She worked as a journalist since she was 18 years old in a Central American press agency. Since her undergraduate years, she has combined her academic work with media projects in radio, video, and journalism. She is currently a professor and senior researcher at the Center for Research and Advanced Studies in Social Anthropology in Mexico City. Her academic work has promoted indigenous and women's rights in Latin America. She has done field work in indigenous communities in the Mexican states of Chiapas, Guerrero, and Morelos, the Guatemalan refugees and with African immigrants in the south of Spain. She has published 22 books and numerous scholarly articles. Her academic work has been translated to English, French, and Japanese. Her research interests cover ethnic studies, legal and political anthropology, post-colonial feminisms, and activist research. She has worked extensively on exploring plural identities in Chiapas, Mexico's southernmost state, as well as the human rights of Guatemalan refugees in Mexico. Her current projects explore the experience of indigenous women with customary law and national law. Dr. Hernandez is the author of Histories and Stories from Chiapas, Border Identities in Southern Mexico, published also in Spanish, of Sur Profundo, Identidades Indígenas en la Frontera Chiapas-Guatemala, and of Etnografías e Historias de Resistencias, Mujeres Indígenas, Resistencia Cotidiana y Organización Colectiva. She is also co-editor of Descendant Women, Gender and Cultural Politics in Chiapas, Mayan Lives, Mayan Utopias, the Indigenous Peoples of Chiapas and the Zapatista Rebellion, The Other Word, Women and Violence in Chiapas Before and After Acteal, among other books. Dr. Hernandez is recipient of the Martin Deskin Oxfam Award and her activist research and of the Simón Bolívar Chair at Cambridge University for her academic trajectory. She is currently a Tinker Visiting Professor at UT Austin for the fall semester. Dr. Hernandez's newest book on which she will speak this evening is Multiple Injustices, Indigenous Women, Law, and Political Struggle, now in press at the University of Arizona Press, but I believe it was, it's been published, right, correct? Yes, just tonight, and we have copies here. Wonderful. Sociologist Boaventura de Sousa Santos describes her book as an eloquent, engaged, and extremely well-informed narrative on indigenous women's movements and on their creative use of legal and political tools to advance their struggles. Gender and women's studies scholar Chandra Mohanty describes multiple injustices as a unique roadmap of decolonizing feminist scholarship anchored in politically committed, deeply thoughtful, solidarity work with indigenous women. And now please help me give a warm welcome to Dr. Rosalba Aida Hernandez Castillo.
Is that better? Yes? Well, buenas noches de nuevo. <laughs> Good evening. What I was saying is that I don't think, uh, I don't want to sound new age, but I don't think that this is a coincidence that this closing the cycle of 25 years of work in issues of gender and ethnic justice in Mexico coincides with the opening of this new program in gender, ethnic studies, and global studies that my colleague and dear friend Francisca James Hernandez has been promoted so deeply. I think that we both share a commitment for a different kind of academia in which the knowledge that we have can be used for something else than publishing books. And I uh, have to be honest that for many years I questioned myself why Francisca decided to come to Pima College instead of going to somewhere else. And today when I spent the entire morning with her students and I saw the impact that she's having in the life of these new generations of young scholars, I understand the importance of the political project that she's developing with education. And I'm sure that this collective project that is promoting for uh, all of you as academic community with the gender, ethnic, and global studies will be a very important space to continue with critical thinking. So I feel honored that my book, that closes the cycle, is, is an excuse to open a new cycle and that at the same time it opens uh, this new lecture. I was asking uh, Francisca if the lecture will have a continuity in, in your honor. And she was telling me that she doesn't know if she has the energy, but she will try to maintain. And there are many people here, so we can, uh, uh, in, in um, Cambridge, I had the, uh, I was invited and I have the honor to give a lecture that was called the Margaret, uh, Lady Margaret Lecture in, um, in Christ College. That is the, the college to which uh, uh, Charles Darwin belonged. And uh, Lady Margaret was a queen and, and she promoted the imperial colonial uh, project. So I feel that there is uh, a better uh, privilege for me to be today in this lecture that has the name of a woman that is committed to social justice, to gender justice, and to struggle against racism. So thank you for honoring me with it. So uh, I just want to t tell you a little bit about what is this book about. That I, I, It's the first time that I have the book in my hands. It was a surprise by my editors who are here, I think here from a, a University of Arizona Press and I'm saying that it closed the cycle of 25 years of working with issues of uh, um, gender justice and indigenous people's rights because what I try to do with this book during my sabbatical is to take different experiences in which I have been involved of activist research uh, in Mexico, Guatemala, and Colombia. So the book refers to the three countries, and I have always tried to maintain a Latin American perspective in my work, and not just in writing, but also uh, in including in the curricula of my seminars the voices and theorizations of Latin American theories, and very important for me, of indigenous intellectuals and Native American intellectuals. So in that sense, it's also an honor for me that um, a member of the Navajo people, a young scholar, will be with us today to comment my work. And this uh, um, dialogue of three generations or four generations, uh, also with Madeline, uh, it's uh, a possibility of building uh, knowledge collectively and through different generations. Well, the book, um, what I do in this book is to systematize my experience that in a way had been collective experience with mujeres sabias, with wise women from the three countries that in different contexts had been struggling for uh, in, in the intersection of two struggles that sometimes are seen as excluded or confronting each other. The struggle for the recognition of the collective rights of indigenous peoples and the struggle for gender justice. And um, this is a huge debate in the United Nations and in many other areas in which there are perspectives that think that the recognition of the collective rights of indigenous peoples will violate uh, women's rights. 
And uh, I, I was invited by the United Nations to an encounter in uh, New York a long time ago that was when this, the idea of this book started. Because I was surprised with the very ethnocentric perspectives that many feminists had about the indigenous peoples. So on one hand, I totally agree with their concerns for gender justice, but the way that they use certain specific practices of indigenous peoples to represent an entire culture, and through those representation to disqualify the indigenous cultures was very problematic for me. Um, there is a famous uh, uh, political scientist whose name is uh, uh, Susan Moller Okin, who wrote a book that uh, is called Is Multiculturalism Good for Women? And in this book she says that it is better than the bad uh, cultures of the immigrants to the United States and to Canada disappear uh, if they violate women's rights. And when I read that book, I feel as a Mexican that has a part of her family in the United States as immigrants for whom their culture is so important, I feel so offended with this kind of representations that this feminist woman was doing. And I was a feminist also, I am a feminist. So in my search to other ways to imagine um, gender justice that considers the culturally grounded a context in which the struggles of women of different cultures take place. I uh, start to search and I was very ins inspired for Chican by Chicano feminism, but also by um, the feminism of the Global South, Chandra Mohant is an Indian feminist who has written a lot about this white feminism that colonized the bodies and the minds of uh, women of the Global South. And with this concern, I start to. Uh, I went back to Mexico after doing my PhD, and I just start to work uh, with indig organized indigenous women that were working with those two struggles. When they were in front of the Mexican state, they were criticizing the discourse on mestizaje that talks about Mexico as a mixed uh, nation and uses. Uh, the Mesoamerican cultures, mainly Mesoamericans, for the national discourse, but at the same time maintains a lot of practices and public policies that exclude indigenous peoples. So indigenous people become just a token, a symbol in a nationalism that is still is very racist. So confronting the state, this organized woman to whom the Zapatista woman were a very important part, were saying, we want our cultures to be recognized. We want the collective rights of our people to be recognized. And the, our uh, local governments, our customary law, we want our territorial rights to be recognized. We don't want the minings from Canada, from the US to come here to pollute our rivers, to expropriate our lands. We want to have control over our territories. But at the same time that they were confronting the monocultural conception of the nation with the state, they were talking with their own local authorities and they were saying, but we want to have a say in what is customary law. We want to have a participation in our local governments. We want to participate in the local justice tribunals, what in the US many Native Americans call tribal law. So, um, when I get close to these women that were struggling to impact their own local and justice systems, I uh, realized that in their political discourses and in their practices, we could find a theorization about culture. And it was a theorization that conceives culture as a historical product that is always reconstituting itself. And that when a cultural practice um, is transform and challenge the privilege of certain groups, people scream and say, oh, there is a danger for our culture. But where other cultural practices are transformed, many indigenous peoples have uh, cars, use the media, and nobody will say that their culture will be affected. But if an indigenous woman want to inherit land or want to participate in the tribal courts or want to choose their own husband, 
there are certain voices in their communities that say, oh, there are challenging our cultures. And those women that are looking for change within their own communities are also part of their culture for which are demanding recognition. So for me as an anthropologist, when I start to read those documents, I, I realized that it, there was an anti-essentialist perspective of culture. What it means is that it's not a conception that thinks that culture is A, B, and C, and it's eternal, and it will always have to be A, B, and C. If not, it will disappear. So it was a very um, a, uh, historical conception of culture that was in those documents. And for me, many of their voices are not just data to be analyzed in books. Those voices are theorizations about social reality that I use in my courses. And so after working for a while in how this, for many years, how those women were impacting uh, customary law and the local justice systems, I realized that I was using a lot of my energy uh, because I was a feminist and all those feminist voices that were saying, be careful with culture, be, car be careful with collective rights. I concentrate a lot of my struggle in seeing what was going on in customary law. But at the same time, the Mexican penal law was terribly racist and was putting into jail and indigenous poor people, peasant people, and uh, specifically in the last two governments, the war against drugs had been a war against peasants, against women, ag against poor people. The big narcos are not in jail, exception of the Chapo, but because all what we know. <laughs> but what is going on is that indigenous peoples are being uh, uh, used to show uh, statistics and to show that they are doing something against the narco uh, uh, cartels. And in many cases, there are women that in the pyramid of the uh, drug um, market are in the bottom. So I found on jail indigenous women whose sons had been um, growing marijuana in her land. And the military came, and he was not there. And they took the elder woman of 70-year-old and put her in jail without a, tr a translator. And she, when I arrived to the jail, she had been there for seven years without knowing what was going on there. So that was the beginning of a new stage in my career in which I started to work about penal justice and to analyze how a structural racism works in the penal Mexican system. So this book has a section that talks about the struggle of women in customary law. And I also wanted to see other experiences in Guatemala and Colombia in which women are impacting customary law. And then another section of the book has to do with the penal law and how structural racism works. And in that section, I don't, wanna, I don't want to talk a lot about it, but I, I talk about a, a project that I shared with the students this morning about an editorial project in which indigenous and mestizo women on jails are publishing their own books. I uh, started the project with them, and now they have published 12 books already. They, na they write the books, but they learn how to edit. So University of Arizona, Arizona Press has a competition on the Mexican jails, and they are beautiful books. And the cover of this book is a painting by uh, in one of the workshops in which they use um, a Japanese technique that is called sumie to manage their emotions through painting. So the emotions that were moved in their creative writing uh, were marked in the book. And I also talk in the book about a, a most recent experience in which I have been participating as an expert witness in the Inter-American Court in cases of sexual violence against indigenous women. So I talk uh, also about what are the possibilities of international um, justice and the international legislation for women's rights in context uh, of violence against indigenous women. And well, the uh, line that goes through all the chapters is how can we uh, combine uh, social activism, activism for social justice with serious academic research. And I want to confront the ideas of those positivistic perspectives that think that if you want to work for social justice, you should just become an activist and leave academia. And if you want to do serious academia, you have to dedicate yourself of write, to write books. 
I think that to construct knowledge in dialogues with the social actors with whom we work has an epistemological uh, privilege. It helps you to know, it's not only that uh, I'm against the positivistic idea of pure knowledge, is that I vindicate that building knowledge in dialogues, uh, multicultural and intercultural dialogues, help us to know better the complexity of reality. And uh, so it's also a methodological reflection on activist research. And I just want to finish by saying that the book is the result of different uh, collective projects and that I have had the privilege as a scholar, as an activist, as a Mexican woman to be surrendered by wise women, mujeres de conocimiento, and this is another experience today. I work in a, re a graduate research center called CIESAS that is in Mexico City. We have created an, a special line of um, an, in the PhD in social anthropology of legal anthropology. And I'm working with six marvelous women, all women, I don't know why we were not, we didn't want to exclude any men, but we're just of different generations. And we have been able to build an academic community in which competition and uh, among women is not what characterizes our group. We're working together, we're trying to help the younger uh, scholars that are in what you call here the tenure track uh, line to work and to get their tenure. And we are trying to create the spaces of dialogue, of collective uh, knowledge. So I own this book also to my colleagues, Maria Teresa Sierra, Mariana Mora, Rachel Cider, Morna Macleod, uh, Carolina Robledo, that are part of this team of marvelous women with whom I work in, in Mexico. So I want to finish by inviting some of their Pima College students to also think there is also the idea that the Latin Americans have to come to the States to do their graduate studies. And I think that you also can gain a lot of Im immigrating in the opposite direction. Right now, one of my of the professors in CSS uh, did her master in UT Austin and her PhD with us, and now she got a position with us and stay in Mexico. She's Mexican American and she immigrated in the opposite direction. So uh, we have a program, look for CSS in the internet, and probably if some of you want to try graduate studies. We, we have a beautiful team of women working, and so this is what I'm presenting. Thank you. Thank you so much, that was fascinating. It's an honor to be in your presence. So now we will turn to discussing Dr. Hernandez's work. And in preparation, we have asked all of the participants to read portions of multiple injustices. Among the participants are two Pima students we invited to be a part of this intergenerational conversation, Watona Shorty and Madeline Anderson. In order for you to meet them in their own voices, we've asked them to uh, relay a personal statement by way of introduction. So if you could please introduce yourselves and you can use a microphone which is already on. Yeah. Okay, Yat A, my name is Watana Shorty and I'm a full-blooded Navajo from Northern New Mexico. I attended Farmington High and while I was attending high school, I had to travel 60 miles back and forth every day to complete high school and also start my college career. Um, I've been here in Pima for about three years now, and I'm currently studying to get my associates in general studies and minor in anthropology as well. And my goal is to attend Eller College of Law to study Native American law because, you know, um, I'm way out here, far away from my reservation, and the only way that I have contact with my family or what goes on on my reservation, of course, is through, so, through, through social media, so that's the way I keep in contact and see what issues go on back home, so, and that's my main goal, is to go back home and help my community and help, help uh, the younger generation realize that, you know, getting your knowledge is a good thing and it shouldn't be seen as a bad thing, you know, because, um, the way I see it is I live in two different worlds. I live 
of course, in the Belagana world, which is the white man's world. And I have my own cultural identity where I have to believe in my cultural beliefs as well. So um, I'm very happy to be here today to be a part of this discussion and you know have my perspective be here. So um, that's my story. <laughs> Uh, hello, <laughs> um, I'm Madeline Anderson. Uh, I actually attended high school in Tucson, Arizona at a local charter school by the name of Accelerated Learning Lab, um, which I attended for my freshman through junior year. And during that time, uh, I established an intersectional feminist club, uh, which I attempted to get a large amount of participation within our school um, and uh, that's actually a large part of the theory we're going to be discussing today, uh, which is the intersectionality between, you know, uh, gender, racism, uh, colonialism, uh, social, uh, economic status. Um, and I started attending classes. I took uh, my gender, sexuality, and culture class uh, because of um, background knowledge that I have, and then also an interest in trying to deconstruct these oppressions in society and trying to fix them uh, at a, uh, yeah. Um, and then uh, I also enjoy reading theoretical works such as uh, Derrida, Derrida, Wittgenstein, uh, Foucault, uh, and I also had previously read uh, one of Roslava's books, uh, Dissident Women, uh, which uh, was mentioned in the introduction uh, because the woman who headed my intersectional feminist club had encouraged me to read it because of my interest in feminist indigenous revolutionary movements. Um, and so I was very excited to be uh, engaged in this discussion just because of my appreciation for her work. So uh, that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Watona and Madeline. So now we'd like to open up the exchange to the audience for questions and comments. And we have a microphone here that Mike will be passing around. So Mike will be passing the mic <laughs> around for questions. And uh, please keep your statements short so we may accommodate more people. First, yes, we'll have a response from the panelists, and then we will have the questions and answers. Thank you. I guess I do. Muy buenas tardes. Y hay que dar gracias a la nación Tohonohotam por compartir su tierra con nosotros. Let us share, let us thank the Tohono Nation for sharing their land with us. Uh, there is such a rich book in front of us. There is such a series of rich experiences that I am really at a loss of where to start. But the first thing I want to say is that the marvelous job that Francisca and Rosalia have done here is something that we have to recognize. It has taken us <laughs> yeah. uh, in, in 1969, when Berkeley was trying to work out their ethnic studies program, as a matter of fact, when many of the universities in this country were having sit-ins, uh, Pima Community College decided to have a curriculum that would respond to the needs of the community. And what's the Tucson community? Well, you know, <laughs> if you read some books, it's all white. But if you look a little further, it has great diversity. We have Mexicanos, we have Yoemi people, and we have Tohono Ota. Four languages in this tiny town. Then there may be others, but those. And so to respond to that community, to respond to those needs, was a wonderful challenge. And today, there are some people here who joined me in that challenge. Guadalupe Castillo, Margot Cowan, and a few years later, Isabel Garcia. And <laughs> there are, 
There are others as well. It, it is so uh, sitting here, we're sitting and standing on the shoulders of many people of Tucson. But not all of us are from here. I'm from Douglas. Uh, Guadalupe is from here. <laughs> and I always look to her when I want to know something about the history of Tucson because she is a person who has that, that perspective. You can read all the stuff you want in the world and she will always have something more to add that is not in the book. So knowing that, I go back to what you speak of as the construction of knowledge and objectivity and how there are certain discourses that are always, uh, if not marginalized, left out or misunderstood. And, and so the struggle that I see since 1969 has been precisely that struggle that many of us have to bring into the mainstream discourse into the struggle for social justice all these cultural knowledge that we have, but not cultural of tacos and mariachi and that, you know, that's all right, that's wonderful, but that has to do with our economic life, that has to do with the segmentation of the labor force, that has to do with the fact that it wasn't until mid-century, that is the 20th century, that the men, Mexican men who worked in the mines earned only half of what the others earned. So when feminism came about, <laughs> we had terrible battles in this community because many of us, of course, we wanted gender rights. No question, gender justice was important. I see all these young women that's not the way Pima was in 1970. The young women were studying either nursing or business administration, uh, not business administration, but you know, secretarial work. And where were the men? In the social sciences, the hard sciences, the professions. So I would teach a class that would have one woman in it and all the 30 others would be young men. So yes, we wanted gender justice. And, and the women's movement was growing. There was all this talk about the Equal Rights Amendment to be put in the Constitution. But you know, Equal Rights Amendment would not help women in unions. It would not help women workers. The Equal Rights Amendment was a very individualistic way of looking at the rights of women. And so many of us spoke out some young women from the Yoemi group, some young women from the Tohono Ota, and some of us Mexican Americans. And so there were many feminists in this town who would not speak to us <laughs> because we were seen as traitors. So when I see you pick up these themes and bring this very profound way of looking at the law, and how we are living under laws that protect individual rights, but we do not live in many of our homes, in our ways of life, in our communities, we do not live as having the top be the individual goal, but rather the goal of our families and our communities. So we live in this contradiction, and I want to congratulate you for the clarity that you bring in the way that law develops and the way that we have dynamic cultures, how our cultures can change. They don't need to be the same all the time, but that we can use the discourse of law. We use the discourse of rights, of course we do, for what we want. And we're talking of human rights, but we get into the big discussion of human rights. Are we talking of the human rights of one individual? We're talking of our collective community rights. So the clarity you bring to this is wonderful. I recommend every student, I recommend every teacher 
<laughs> that is concerned with social change, to read the clear way in which he is able to let us see this big difference on how we have wonderful rights. It's good to have rights. I'm not against that at all. We all need rights. We all need to be recognized as human beings with dignity and all those things. But we also have to have collective rights. We have to have the right to form our own decisions and what we want for collective rights and the <coughs> dynamic way that that has to happen. So thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, although I haven't yet been able to read the entirety of the book that has just been released, uh, very exciting, um, from what I was able to read in the introduction first chapter and the segments that I've read from her previous book uh, that she co-published, Dissident Women, um, one of the things that I find really wonderful and amazing about uh, the specific research that's being done, which was uh, the majority of the content in the first chapter, was that instead of relying upon you know, previous hierarchical forms of research in which you go into these communities and you assume that you're the dominant individual and that you are the one bringing the knowledge and extracting the knowledge, um, you know, there's this kind of push to revolutionize that, which hasn't been new, which you stated in the book, that it was something that had existed previously, um, but that there was a push in academia to uh, instead go to the communities and find the concerns that they have and work with them in the ways of discussion to figure out what's the best way to attack social problems. And she listed four specific examples in her book in which she tried revolutionizing this notion. Uh, and I, I mean, that was one of the things that I found uh, very, very wonderful uh, about the book. I mean, obviously, it's it's amazing, and me as a student, I can't really offer much criticism, uh, but uh, lots lots of praise, and I, I was... Are you going to do a Q&A, or is it just... Well, that was the idea that they can ask questions, no? It just almost feels a bit odd to be, you know, like, oh, she's so wonderful. And, you know, no, 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 that's the idea. Yeah, no, okay. Um, and so one of the things that you commented in our class uh, outside of, you know, revolutionizing research was um, specifically the work that you've been working on recently in the way of uh, revolutionizing, you know, the prison and instead of, you know, going for a complete abolition of prison, which you said was uh, unfeasible at this point in Mexico because of the uh, historical uh, elements that exist with the prison industrial complex. Um, instead, trying to come up with reforms to uh, help the indigenous women that are being unjustly prosecuted for these uh, extreme drug laws. Um, and uh, you actually mentioned in our class uh, this new wave of reform that's happening in the prisons that isn't uh, beneficial to the indigenous women, but rather really harmful. And I know you discussed it with our class, but I feel like it would be uh, something that the audience might want to hear. So I was wondering if you could elaborate further on um, uh, ACA and uh, the various um, globalization of you know the prison industrial complex that's harming indigenous women. Yes. Well, one of the of the chapters of the book related with the uh, penal system, but it's also put the penal Mexican penal system in a global context. And what I was sharing with them, that is part of what I analyze in the book, also, is a new uh, process that is taking place in Mexico with the American Certification Association, ACA. 
that through the Merida project, that is an agreement that was signed between Mexico and the United States to get funding in the war against drugs. So the U.S. is giving money to reform the Mexican jails. And it's a very uh, complicated process because they are using the discourses of human rights um, to uh, domesticate the social spaces of prison in a very problematic way. So what they say, for example, just to give you an example, is that uh, right now in the Mexican prison, there is uh, spaces in which women can, co can cook collectively. And as Mexicans, we know the importance of the culinary culture for people. So they have their own dishes, they can cook. They have the food that the prison gives them, but they can cook. And now with the process of privatization through the ACA certification process, they have been denied the right to cook. All the uh, cooking appliances were taken away from them, and they are hiring a, a private service with like TV dinners, like the ones that you get in the airplanes. And the discourse, the official discourse is that they will have a balanced uh, diet and that with those TV dinners, they were assured a, a, a balanced diet. But they, they there are different reforms that are very, very problematic. In the name of security, for example, they cannot uh, stay in uh, collective uh, spaces as they did in the past. So they uh, spend almost all day in their cells, and they, they can go out to walk. And what I was sharing with the students about this, this is the kind of model that you have in this country, and that had been deeply criticized, because it's not a, a model that is searching for readaptation, but it's punishment, and that's medieval. So we have societies in which uh, science has been developed, so that we are going to Mars, to the moon, and we do not, we are not able to have new ways of social arrangements in which the persons that uh, violate the law can have another possibilities besides punishment. And, and these kind of systems, what they do when they isolate people, when they uh, isolate the bodies of those persons, when they do not allow them to go have collective spaces, workshops like the workshops that we were teaching, uh, well, it's not doing anything for rehabilitation. So I'm very concerned because the model had arrived last year. ACA arrived to Mexico. There are now seven private prisons already. Well, there are it's it's state and private funding. And they are developing also the maquila, the, um, the how do you say maquila? maquila? Well, the maquila is the industry, the prison industry in, uh, with very low salaries, and I was commenting that when I was doing the research about the ACA uh, uh, reforms, I found in the web page of the state of Mexico where uh, our present president, Peña Nieto, was governor, an advertising saying uh, inviting the uh, entrepreneurs to invest in prisons, and they say they, uh, you will have uh, flexible uh, schedules, you don't have a minimum salary, and water, light, and gas will be subsidized by the prison system. And it was in, in the web. So I was so upset about what was going on. And uh, well, the, the prison project in which I participate is in danger to disappear right now with the reforms. The inmates were in, uh, in hunger strike a few uh, uh, months before I came here. And um, so I feel that all the, I was talking about the importance of doing transnational alliance because the kind of model that you have here has been proved that is not working, that is also marked by racialization, by poverty. So the people of color are the people that are being put into prison in the United States more than any other group, and it's the same thing in Mexico. Although in Mexico, we do not discuss racism in academia. It's a taboo topic. When you go to jails, you don't find the same kind of people that you will find in a private school. So the jails have colors. The people of the darker color are and the poorer status are in jail, are the ones that cannot pay the price of justice. 
So I feel that assistant scholar, part of my work in this book that has an equivalent in other publications in Spanish and radio programs, and I have been writing for it, Mexican newspaper called La Jornada. So I'm on a um, article, I have a, a, day, a monthly column there, and I have been writing about this because I think that is a global struggle that we have to learn how to deal uh, in a different way with the social conflicts and problems that we are confronting. So thank you. May I make a comment? Uh, what you bring up is so uh, much in tune with other things. Uh, the neoliberalism that has impacted our country and now we take everywhere else. Uh, there is a law that has just been passed in Mexico changing the whole system of labor justice and how labor uh, conflicts are to be resolved. And of course, you know, one of the great things that there wa had been in the Constitution had been a series of worker rights. And we'll have to look carefully at that law because it appears that the right to uh, unions, what unions can do, uh, the role of the strike, they're all, it's all questionable right now, but it looks as if it has been uh, made like in the U.S. so that the American companies that go in there do not have to deal with different kinds of labor rights. And I'm afraid that uh, this whole issue of, of uh, neoliberalism and how it has spread has a big impact, and you bring out much of that also in your book, which I think is very relevant, uh, especially with the political scene that we have today in our country. Uh, what we're really talking about is neoliberalism and the kind of capitalism that we want to have. Yes, it's, and it's the same thing with education, no? Uh, the privatization of public education, it's, it's a big issue. That's where the teacher strikes have been taking place recently. So it's a big wave in which scholars, we have to position ourselves very critically of what are the effects for social justice that these economic reforms are having, you know, and in, in, in different spheres. And so you're very into collaborative research and the notion that you need to work with the people whose lives you also want to uh, benefit with the research, uh, like the b blend of activism and academia. Um, and actually in the book, it wasn't elaborated on a lot but uh, in the parts that I read, but there was uh, a brief section stating that not only is this something that needs to be done, but it's something that is also now currently demanded by indigenous groups uh, and indigenous organizations uh, when you want to engage in research and how um, many times when you were invited to various uh, indigenous gatherings, uh, you were encouraged and anyone who was, you know, Mestiza, was encouraged to uh, stay silent during the meetings or and instead listen to what the indigenous women had to say. So. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate more on uh, the specific situations that you're seeing this kind of shift where you know indigenous women uh, and indigenous communities are uh, really emphasizing their autonomy in the situation and not willing to put up with the hegemonic uh, feminism of you know urban feminism, urban mestiza feminism. Yeah, what, what we find now, and, and this is all over Latin America, is that um, the politicization of indigenous peoples and their political organizations and the demands for rights is also uh, a, a demand for the social scientists. They do not want to be objects of a study anymore. They don't want to be the path for the academics and the scholars to build their careers and live. And um, so it's not just that activist research is just like because you are committed and you want to have good intention, it's also a demand. The, as when you get to a community, 
in many, many communities in Mexico, I met somebody from Oaxaca previously. Well, in Oaxaca now, the community say, we want you to go to the Asamblea and we want you to explain the people in the community what is your research about, how are you going to do it, what are you going to give us back, what kind, and so there, are, there is a, a, a very clear demand that they don't want to be objects of a study. And that's an ethical and political question that should be discussed in the, all the social science. That's in the general terms of how there is a, uh, and I think that in the case of Mexico, the Zapatista movement in 1994 was very important to change that hierarchical relationship between social science and indigenous peoples. Uh, in Chiapas, I don't know how many of you know, but the Harvard uh, Chiapas project was a project of Harvard University that was in Chiapas for 70 years. And they didn't translate an article to Spanish during many, many years. There is an entire book like this of publications by Harvard University about indigenous peoples in Chiapas. And None of the articles of that book, later there came new generations that, well, long story, but in that book, those articles were never published. The indigenous peoples uh, never knew what the scholars were doing in their lands. And this situation cannot happen anymore. And the people of different indigenous regions are demanding a new kind of a scholarship and a scholarship that is ethically respectful to those communities and that uses knowledge uh, for the common good. And specifically in the case of indigenous women, what I saw, and I also talk about 1992, that it's the celebration of the encounter of the two worlds, as it was called euphemistically, um, got together indigenous people from all the continent that were sharing their experience of colonialism, including Native Americans. And from that experience, it was a very strong continental indigenous women's movement that um, was, as, as we were talking before, it was with Raquel, it was inspired with certain ideas of feminism, but had a lot of problems with the very liberal individualistic perspective of social change. And, and the, many of those women had alliance with urban feminists, but many of these urban feminists, including myself, we went to those communities with a lot of arrogance, thinking that we will teach those women about their rights. And we always were putting ourselves in a position of teachers. We were there to teach. And we were not <coughs> humble enough to understand that we have first to learn and that they had many things to teach us also. Also, so many things that are so internalized. For example, the issue of, ch of uh, body shape, no? Not now that Trump talks so much about aesthetics. We, uh, there are so many young women that suffer a lot because of the cultural practice of Western societies about beauty and the body. But we don't question those cultural traditions. We always think that women in urban uh, um, regions, and in the case of Mexico, that mestiza women were always better off than indigenous women. And we didn't see a lot of the collective networks that they have. And for example, in urban areas, there is a lot of domestic violence that it suffer inside the houses there is shame to talk about domestic violence. And in many indigenous communities where there is domestic violence, is seen as a collective problem. When a woman is being hit, she goes out and scream and an entire community comes, and at least in the Maya area, it is considered that domestic violence can bring illness to the community. So a family that is suffering uh, domestic violence can affect the entire community. So the elders get together and they want to solve that problem because it's not this poor woman in her room, but it's a problem of us that as a human collectivity is being affected. And us as urban feminists didn't see those networks, didn't see that many times we leave our violence in silence and shame. 
and that do not have the networks that they do have. So that they are not always, they are the victims and we will be the persons to teach them how to go out of violence. That we have to share the strategies. But it took me many years to learn that. It took me many years to see the arrogance of my attitude as a feminist a scholar that wanted to teach women's rights. And uh, one of the important lessons is, has to do with what Madeline mentioned. In their last encounters, they say the mestizo urban woman can be respectful witness. You have to be silent. You can learn from our discussions. Probably in the future we can have dialogues, but when you learn to talk just in the uh, exact moment in which you have to talk. Because it used to happen that in the mixed meetings, the mestizo urban women were always lecturing. So it's a lesson, and I've, I have this feminist uh, lawyer who had been working for indigenous women for all her life, and she was crying when they told her to be quiet. And she said, they, do, they are not recognizing my work. And I was telling her, they are. It's <laughs> just that we have to learn to listen. It's a huge challenge. So. Okay, so um, uh, you put it, pointed out some good things there. And when I go back to my community, I do notice that, you know, the women, they're very quiet when it comes to domestic violence. And um, I just feel like, in my opinion, the tribal law doesn't really do a lot of things for, you know, how they're supposed to be protecting our tribe. and our cultural grounds, but they don't really do that, which is very sad. And it's very sad to see that the women in my community are being downgraded and, and uh, being from a matrilineal society, um, you know, we're not supposed to be um, president. We have our own government system. We're not supposed to be president of our government system because women are the care caregivers and we are the ones that give life. Um, it's just it's kind of it's really sad. It really hurts me to s to see that when I go home. But um, I do want to be one of those voices, and you are a very good role model for me. You know, I just met you just today, and I, I haven't heard of you, heard of you before. So it it really inspires me. You know, to go back to my community and think of how to and how to go and maybe work my way into tribal law to you know to help the women of my community because a lot of things that go on there it, it does affect a lot of the women and a lot of the children around because the women you know are the ones that are always at home so and a lot of them don't have that voice to go out and tell tell the government systems that what is going on and it's like they're shy to admit you know what goes on in our in our culture, in our community, so. I wanted to mention that um, there is a, a, a Native American lawyer, her name is Maori White Eagle, look for her. Um, she's from, uh, I think she's from the Chickasaw Nation, and she has been working a lot in the transformation of tribal law from a gender perspective. And she came to Mexico and she got together with some of these women that I talk, uh, who, whose experience I share here, that are working to change their community law. And uh, one of the issues that they were discussing is that um, that those situation of the, that m in many areas tribal law is very patriarchal and they do not find justice there. But to think that a state law will come to defend them from tribal law is a trap because then you have the state law that comes with a lot of racism and new problems arrive. So the bed for many of those, well, for this network of Native American women is the demand for self-determination but the transformation of tribal law. And well, it's like the transformation of our laws, what we have to do, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a long process and it has to be collective. We open to the public? Yeah. Okay, so now we're going to open it up for the audience to have to ask questions or comments. And Mike has the microphone and Dr. Ricardo Castro Salazar has the first question. Is it right there? Yes. Hello. Thank you. Thank you for, for being with us. Is is this working? Yes. Um, 
Uh, I, one of my, my areas of research has been critical race theory. And, and from that perspective, you, what you are doing here is, is conveying to us different forms of truth. So thank you for that. Um, and you're making me think about the, the, the concept of race, not as a biological concept, but as a, um, um, really as a metaphor for um, economic division and, and social decay. And um, from that perspective, I, I'd like to hear your, your perspective on, on how the, the intersection between um, uh, indigenous human rights and education is evolving in, in Mexico at this point and in this nation at the same time. by saying that one of uh, my concerns as a scholar it's it's been uh, to try to translate some of the critical race theory to Mexico and I have had huge debates with lawyers about it um, I don't want to go a lot into that because I have been my struggle in the last two or three years there is a rejection that I call methodological nationalism against anything of the theory that comes from the north and especially from the United States. And if you do your PhD here, and you come back and you analyze racism, they will say, oh, it's because you went to the States. There is no racism in Mexico. That's a problem of the gringos. And, and then you go to the jail, and you see the faces that are in jail. So I, I, to be, I want to say that, of course, races do not exist as biological realities, but the hierarchies that are created in the imagination of races, and in the case of Mexico, of the inheritance of the caste system. Because you have, that caste system is still exists. What is the NACO? The NACO, it's the urban indigen of indigenous background that doesn't speak an, in an indigenous language anymore or doesn't remember anything about his origins, but is considered by the lighter Mexicans as somebody that doesn't have any value. NACO is, is, you will hear it in young people all the time, and it's a very racist uh, expression that people do not recognize as racist. So I am part now of a new network that was created at UNAM by Olivia Gall, a sociologist that is called Integra, and is a scholar against racism. And we have been trying to bring the debate to the social media, to the radio, to because there is a big denial. The idea that we are all half indigenous, we are mestizos, so if we are mestizos, we cannot be racist. It's, an, it's the common justification that you will hear. And I was telling the students this morning, just, you just have to turn on the TV and see what kind of faces are they showing that had nothing to do with the 90% of the Mexican population that doesn't have those phenotypes. And uh, so I think that r a critical race theory has a lot to teach, especially in the analy analysis of the penal system to Mexico. Because although racism works in a different way than in the United States, it's not a racism that works through segregation as much as to forced integration and the denial of the cultural roots of many of those peoples. So now, there is a huge struggle going to the education and intercultural dialogues. Um, there is a new generation of indigenous scholars, there are very few but very important, that are pressuring to have a real intercultural reform in education. Because we have a lot of jargon about multiculturalism in education, but usually there is still is the same professors that speak only Spanish, and uh, what, and when you have an indigenous professor, many times they are sent to a different indigenous region. And the reality of indigenous peoples in Mexico City, that is a huge concentration of indigenous people, have been denied for many, many years. So I entire neighborhoods in Mexico City of urban indigenous peoples that have lived in the city for five generations, and it happens like Mexican here. Uh, uh, people uh, still talk about indigenous immigrants. And I was talking to Juanes to say, say, I'm not an immigrant. I was born here. My father was born here. My grandfather was born in Mexico City. 
they speak Otomi and they have lived in the city for five generations and they are called indigenous immigrants just because they have an indigenous background. So there is a huge challenge to uh, really include this diversity in education. And uh, specifically in the case of CSAs, we have a PhD program of ethnolinguistics uh, in which all the students come from indigenous uh, background and speak an indigenous language. And uh, while well they are trying to make a difference in the regions, and it's a huge challenge, also because racism also impact the hiring process. For example, to get a position in Mexico, it is required to speak English, or at least to understand and read English. And a lot of the indigenous scholars, they are bilingual, but uh, Spanish and their indigenous language. So we are also trying to change our institutions in those terms. Disculpe, desde su experiencia eh, investiga eh, que ha investigado, ¿cuál es el impacto que tiene eh, los usos y costumbres de los pueblos indígenas para que las mujeres eh, tengan una especie de masoquismo aceptado? Yeah. He's asking me uh, what do I think about the uses of customs of um, of the communities, what is the impact that they had in women, if, and if women are masochists, why do they accept their customary law if they are masochists? That's what he's asking. Bueno, ¿le contesto en español o en inglés? Y luego lo traduzco. I'm going to answer in Spanish and they're going to... ¿Sí? Bueno, vamos. O oh, hago oh, español e inglés. Eh, ¿entiende, ingl ¿Entiende inglés usted no? Bueno, entonces hablo en español y traduzco. Con esta, answer him in Spanish and then translate. Mire, por ejemplo, esa expresión que usted dice de que las mujeres son masoquistas porque aceptan sus usos y costumbres, pues son parte de los estereotipos que se van construyendo y el libro de lo, el libro de lo que habla es precisamente de que si bien hay muchas mujeres que, como dice la compañera, es muy difícil confrontar el poder que tienen la autoridad, es muy difícil confrontar el poder que tienen los caciques, es muy difícil el poder, confrontar el poder que tiene el marido, pero no todas son víctimas. El libro habla, por ejemplo, del caso de Tlahuitoltepec en la zona Mije, en donde las mujeres han estado trabajando para transformar la, el estatuto comunitario y tuvieron a una primera presidenta municipal mujer por usos y costumbres. Entonces, yo eh, la crítica que tengo, aunque coincido con usted que hay muchos usos y costumbres que son muy nocivos para las mujeres, también es cierto que hay muchos lugares en donde las mujeres se han apropiado su propia justicia indígena para transformar la realidad. Y a mí me causa mucho problema que siempre se hable de los usos y costumbres como violatorios a los derechos humanos, porque no siempre es así. Y de entonces de ahí pasamos a decir que todas las… Eh, primero decimos, los usos y costumbres violan derechos humanos, los pueblos indígenas tienen usos y costumbres violatorios a los derechos humanos, están atrasados. Y este, esta, esta correlación que está mucho en la prensa es lo que mi libro quiere enfrentar. So, summarizing what I'm telling him is that this, uh, that there is very difficult in many cases for indigenous women to confront the local authorities and local justice when there are patriarchal systems. But that um, there are many experiences that I write about in which they are organizing to change their customary law, and that I find a problem to always talk about uh, customary law and uses and customs that violate human rights. And then by the logic in the public discourse is they don't refer to customary law or to indigenous law as indigenous law, but as usos and customs, usos y costumbres. That was the term that our uh, friend used it also. And it says, uses and customs violate human rights. Indigenous people had uses and customs, so they are always violate human rights, so they are backwardness. And it's like a logic that goes together. And the book is answering that logic. It's trying to confront that logic. 
by saying that there are many social changes occurring in indigenous regions that come from within, that they don't need a feminist or a leftist activist to save them, that they, are, they have their process and there are things that are going on in those communities. Mine is um, more of a commentary than it is a question. Um, the commentary is that, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for a very enlightening uh, paper. And I was really in admiration when you took just 10 minutes to outline your book in such a clear way. So thank you very much for that. Um, my comment has to do with um, the idea that was already talked about of the um, uh, culture seen as a dynamic and not as a static uh, thing because I originally come from Africa and uh, you know the question of culture is very important it is um, you know it's static when particularly it's a good thing for men and it's dynamic when they don't want to talk about you know, you understand what I mean. Okay, so I, 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 I like that uh, aspect. I also like the aspect of the theorization of women's experiences, because in the academia, as we know, if you don't talk about Derrida and Foucault and, and, um, and Kristeva, then you haven't started to do any theorization. So I like that idea as well. Um, I also like the idea of the wise women because, for instance, in African societies that are, m you know, mostly patriarchal, then they always speak of the wise men. And the wise women, we know that they exist, but nobody talks about them. Um, finally, I wanted to say that one of the reasons that I came to this lecture is, in fact, because of the, um, of the uh, subtitle of your book that speaks about, uh, you know, uh, law and political struggles. Because in Africa, women uh, are subject to three kinds of laws. You have the, I, I come from a French speaking country, so we have the, the, the French law or the Napoleon law. Then we also have the Islamic law. And then we have the customary law. And none of, the, of those laws are kind to women. So I thought it was interesting to, uh, um, to talk about that. Finally, I have a, a suggestion for the ethnic studies that people want to, to, uh, to have here. In Tucson, I've been in Tucson for about 20 years, but in Tucson, when we speak of ethnic law, uh, ethnic studies, the African American and the African studies are discarded. We speak very much of the indigenous uh, law um, studies. We speak about Mexican American uh, studies, but the African and the so it's discarded, and that is reflected even on campuses like the U of A. There is no, um, you know, you have the, uh, American studies, you have the Mexican studies, you have the uh, Native American studies, you have the African American studies, but you don't have a place of encounter, mm -hmm. and I think that that is very important if we are looking at, you know, uh, establishing um, a, uh, an ethnic studies uh, department or, yeah. Uh, I, I want to, to comment to, to your comment <laughs> that uh, one of my concerns also as, as a professor in the university is to diversify the curricula of what are we teaching. And I always tell my students, I just cannot believe that the big theory is only being written in the n global north. So since Fanon uh, wrote about <laughs> a w a black skin, white mask, uh, we in Mexico and in the States have not read almost anything of African theorists. So Latin America and Africa become places to do field work but we do not read the theory that is being produced there. And in the case of Mexico, an important problem is language. So what I did, um, with we are three um, 
friends that went together to, to Stanford and we consider ourselves sisters. So the third one is Liliana Suarez Navas, that I hope that she can come to Pima one of these days. And with Liliana, we put together a book that is called um, Fem uh, La Descolonización del Feminismo, Teorías y Prácticas desde los Márgenes. Decolonizing Feminism Theories and Practice from the Margins. We published that book in Spain in 2003. And uh, what we did is we invite Amina Mama from, uh, from Kenya. Um, we invite um, uh, scholars from Pakistan, from India, uh, from China. And we got funding to translate their work to Spanish. It was the first work by Amina Mama that was translated to Spanish. And, um, and part of the idea also was to want to build bridges but also to remember that um, the theory and the uh, critical thinking about the world is being produced in many areas that are not being listened. And now, I, uh, for me, one challenge that I have, a, a, a part of critical race theory, is that um, Mexican feminist and indigenous movements know nothing about Native American scholars or Native American theories. There is almost nothing translated to Spanish about settled colonialism, and the theories of gender and settled colonialism could be very enlightening to understand what is going on in Mexico. So I translate the work of Renia Ramirez, who had been working about the urban hub of Native American uh, woman in California. She is uh, Ohinawa, I think she's Ohinawa. So I translate and a small work of her, a short article. But I think that also that's another form of doing politics. We have to translate from south to north and from north to south to be able to have a more inclusive curricula in our and and uh, I, I I really I'm, I'm, I think it's great that in high school you are reading Derrida and Foucault. It, I, I think we should continue reading them, but we also have to con to read other authors besides them. Yeah. Um, my question is: um, We have a woman detention center between here and Phoenix that uh, that house women, especially women that are undocumented and going through the penal system. Is there a way that globally that all women that end up in that situation, that there's a formal process to expedite whatever the judgments are going to come down? Because there seems to be a, a, a racial tone to how they proceed with their judgments. Have you encountered a lot of that? Well, uh, one of the reasons why I came to UT Austin is for a, uh, because I have a colleague in UT Austin, her name is Shannon Speed. She's from the Chicasso Nation. Uh, she's Native American and we have been collaborating. And the last four years she has been working with det in detention centers, with uh, women in detention centers in Texas mainly. And wow, what she had found in those detention centers, there are prisons. It's, it's terrible, the situation. And, and if I criticize the prisons, in Mexico, there is a big difference. I, I, I mean, it's terrible what is going on in the prisons, but in the case of, of many of the women in the prisons, they have committed criminal acts for uh, structural reasons or whatever. But what you have in detention centers are women that have not have any previous problem with the law and they're being treated as people that have broke the, break the law. So it's terrible, and uh, so why we are trying to um, create alliance with people that are working in detention centers and prisons, because there is the neoliberal project that is behind both is the same. And uh, so what we have done until now, we create a network that is called SOS, Anti-Racismo, Género y Justicia, SOS, Anti-Racism, Gender and Justice, and we have people that are working in those issues in Canada, Mexico, uh, U.S., and Guatemala. And well, so it's, it's a big challenge, but I think that there are many things in common. Um, 
Buenas tardes. What was your, um, the key to be able to be, uh, to be welcomed in the indigenous communities and to be accepted to do your research? What was your biggest obstacle and how did you overcome it? Well, I think that the one of the biggest one is that at the beginning I didn't speak the local language. And, um, and it had been a challenge I would share with the students today. Uh, first, I work with MAM people who the new generations do not speak the MAM language, so it was easier because everybody was, because of the imposition of the Spanish language in the southern Mexican border. I have this book here. Later, I will share with you. I will have some books for sale. And in this first book, I work with the people that were divided by the border. And, um, and they have lost their language, so it was not such a big challenge. And one of the issues that I have done to be able to create links and is try to connect myself to local projects, not just to do the research. So in the case of the MAM people, I was working with an organic grower, coffee growers cooperative in which women were involved. So I was trying to put my knowledge in their service, helping since from the commercialization. And so this book that is called Histories and Stories from Chiapas is the result of my collaboration with the organic growers in coffee. And, and usually the issue is to try to see what can you offer them that can be useful for what they are doing. Not to arrive with a project in which you have an intellectual curiosity that you want to respond. Uh, I'm very sorry, but I need to go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I think, <laughs> or I leave you in a dialogue and I go back and forth, or we close the dialogue, or uh, I don't know. Uh, Francisca, what do you think? <laughs> What do you tell her about the program? What do you have in mind when I <laughs> So for those of you can ha who can hang on just for a few more minutes. Uh, my name is Francisca James Hernandez. Welcome to everyone. Muy, muy bienvenidos y bienvenidas to Pima College. Um, we do have an initiative, um, as the chancellor announced of ethnic, gender, and global studies. And as um, Raquel Rubio Goldsmith let us know, this is not new. This is part of a long struggle. Um, it is a struggle that began in earnest um, in the 1960s and 70s, and this is just a continuation. Um, so we are um, the generation and, and that is standing on the shoulders of others, and hopefully we can provide shoulders for others to stand on. And that's what we're here to do at Pima Community College. Um, we are part of the community. We want to be even more part of the community. We want to be a connection to the community. And we want the community to know that this is your college. This is your education. And we are here for you. Um, and that's everybody. Um, and we do um, have work to do. Uh, as far as expanding our curriculum and deepening our curriculum and institutionalizing more solidly our curriculum to serve the interests of all students. Ethnic, gender, and global studies is for all students. The research shows that the more students of all races, ethnicities, and genders know about each other and know about themselves, the more engaged they are in education, the more likely that they will stay with their education the more likely they will graduate, and the more likely they will go on to continue their education, or to go on and be people who are engaged in their communities, be informed, and be open-minded and flexible, and have that cognitive flexibility that bilinguals and trilinguals um, have just by virtue of being bilingual and trilingual, they're finding out, right? The Canadian studies. So. Um, that's what we're here to do, is to expand that knowledge, to connect to the community, and to deepen our curriculum to improve the educational opportunities for everybody. Um, so ethnic and gender and global studies is, is a sort of reorganization or re-kind of conceptualization of what we've already be been doing, but trying to expand it more. It's very much part of the college's reorganization under Chancellor Lee Lambert. 
uh, to reorganize the, uh, the college, to um, conform to accreditation standards, but not only that, but go beyond and become a premier community college. Um, and we feel the Ethnic, Gender, and Global Studies Initiative is a vital part of that. Um, you know, I have a, a deep concern. I, our ethnic studies conceptualization is one that is, uh, if you want to call it traditional in the United States, it's a four-discipline discipline. It's one of Mexican-American studies, American Indian studies, African-American studies, and Asian Pacific Island studies. Uh, each of those areas is developed to different degrees at this point. It is a long-term project. Uh, we do feel it's important to address all communities of color that have been historically marginalized in the United States. Um, but of course, our first uh, programs that we need to get, I mean, each is in a, is in a state of uh, uh, progress, let's put it that way. And uh, we feel that Mexican American and Indian Americans, Native American, uh, American Indian studies are a vital priority to, to begin with, given the population that we serve, right? Given our surrounding population, given our student population. Because you might assume that those are strong, vibrant programs at the college. I'm afraid that they're not. But we are working on that and with, um, uh, Chancellor Lambert's leadership, uh, we have seen some really important changes at this college that are now opening up uh, opportunities for us to do this. So it's really vital that we have you, thank you for being here. This is really important to have a good show. We've had a good show. We had our two overflow rooms fill up from what I was told. So that's important because it shows there's a hunger, it shows there's a need, and that people are responding. And that's really important. But we especially need people to come and take our classes because that will really show. <laughs> that will really show, right? So come and take classes if you haven't already. Get your friends, your children, your families to come and take classes and be a part because we're having a lot of things happening in the college right now uh, that are a lot of initi initiatives and we have some uh, and I didn't ever think I would say this we have some fabulous administrators right now <laughs> we, we do thank you for bringing in some fabulous administrators that are really understanding the needs of the community and responding to them. And as, as we celebrate this continuation, uh, I think we should also know that Mexican American Studies, which has been under tremendous fire in Tucson, for those of you who keep up with education, uh, we had a superintendent of Arizona that canceled our program that we had struggled for years to have in the K through 12, but I must tell you that we have a very vibrant and alive Mexican American studies program at the University of Arizona. And uh, <laughs> Dr. O'Leary is here tonight who is the head of the program and it's just moving ahead uh, with all kinds of programs, always with applied um, research, community participation research has been the philosophy of that department. So I just wanted to mention that people finish here and there's a pipeline that takes you straight to the U and then you can get a master's and a PhD. <laughs> um, uh, before everybody start to leave, I want to make a commercial. Uh, it seems like uh, I didn't know that the books will be out, but the, the editor house came. And I'm, I was a little bit disappointed um, when I find out about the prize, you know how the editorial houses work, because right now it's only in hardcover, and hardcovers are very pricey. But um, so they have now the, the book with the author discount. They only have seven books upstairs. And I brought some other of my books that I will have also upstairs, and the, uh, the author prize. So I'm not getting any money, I just want the books to be known so I'm giving you is uh, the author price is almost half price of what what the books are so I I don't know where uh, Francisca are they upstairs where where yeah, well, they're upstairs in the okay 
So I brought, uh, there are a few ones, so just seven of these, and then I will leave, I have some orders that are there that I'm gonna leave, uh, put there that I also will have discount if you order them through the form. We have one more question oh, before we finish. Very, very, very quickly, I, I, I go to Mexico a lot recently, soy argentino, um, and I'm amazed. Uh, I've been listening to your talks on Google, not wanting to know what you had to say. I, I'm amazed at the level of racism, and I'm so pleased that there was one of the first things you mentioned. And you've talked about the penal system, you've talked about the state. But the other uh, institution of oppression that's lasted for the last 500 years for your group is a church. And in these days post-liberation theology, I'm wondering whether the church is an ally um, of yours in your attempt to create some changes, or are they as stratified and as close to the state and the penal system? Are they a hurdle or are they on your side? Well, the church is as diverse as the Mexican society in Mexico. Um, you have uh, fathers like uh, Padre uh, Solalinde, who had been uh, criticizing very deeply the homophobia of the Catholic Church with a recent debate on the equal marriage, and who had been working for. Uh, for immigrants, but you have also, well, the high clerics that are terrible. And um, what I uh, write about in the book, I, it's, not about, um, it's not about religion, law is the center of, just penalty, uh, uh, the justice system and law is the center of the book. But I have a chapter in which I talk about the political genealogies, because one question that I have is, who are these indigenous women that want to change tribal law? What is the background? I mean, I was very surprised from my very ethnocentric perspective. And I found very diverse backgrounds. And so I reconstruct five what I call uh, uh, political genealogies uh, of the indigenous organized women. And one of the five political genealogies is liberation theology. So there are many, especially in Oaxaca and Chiapas and Guerrero. The liberation theology was very important for indigenous women's organization. And uh, what is very interesting about this is that although the liberation theology doesn't have a gender agenda, I mean, it doesn't have the issue of uh, justice for women in the center, because they discuss inequality, exclusion, oppression, many of the women that were using the Bible to analyze the social inequality use the same tools to question they say, how, why are we questioning the patron that is in the finca and we're not questioning the patron that is in the house? So um, I talk here specifically about a very important movement in Chiapas that is called La Coordinadora Diocesana de Mujeres Codimuj, that are uh, feminist nuns that continue in the church, I don't know why, but they're still there. And they are trying to uh, have a feminist perspective within the Catholic Church and they talk about reading the Bibles with the, eye, with the eyes on the heart of a woman, con ojos y corazón de mujer. And there are now 400 indigenous communities that are working in Bible reading groups that are reading the Bible with this perspective. And they are very low profile. Everybody talks about Mendes Arceo when he was alive, um, the, uh, Sal uh, Samuel Ruiz in Chiapas. But those nuns are anonymous nuns that are live in the communities, that are very committed. And the first time that I wrote an academic article about them, I was t because I interviewed several of them who had been living for 30 years in communi indigenous communities, and I say, everybody thinks that the Zapatista Rebellion has to do with Don Samuel and his work, and nobody talks about the important work of nuns. And she said, like, please leave us alone. We don't want to be <laughs> noticed. We want to be able to do our work. The uh, hormiga, trabajo de hormiga, no? Ant work, very silencing. But of course, the high clerics, um, como dice el alto clero? Uh, it's, uh, I and especially right now in Mexico, with the discourses of homophobia, we are having a, a terrible, uh, public debate, very homophobic, coming from uh, Catholic sectors.
Any last comments from the panelists? Okay, well, we'd like to thank you very much for coming and for our panelists here. This was an outstanding conversation. <laughs> an intergenerational conversation, dialogue with role models. All of you are, are role models in the future of, of the Ethnic Studies program at the college. We're very excited about it and we're very grateful that you are here. Just a couple of announcements. Um, the books are upstairs where we started, where the reception was, so if you're interested, uh, please join us upstairs. Also, there's going to be an Ethnic Studies Summit that's statewide that will be here at the downtown campus on March 10th, so mark your calendars for that, please. And we'd also like to thank those that contributed to today's events, the Ethnic, Gender, and Global Studies work group members. Also, Yolanda Gonzalez, Support Specialist at East Campus, uh, Andrew Catcher, also from the, from the downtown campus, assistant to the president. Mike Rahm, right here behind me, AV specialist at the downtown campus. Mike Lopez, student life coordinator at the downtown campus. And our very dedicated faculty and administrators, Dr. Francisca James Hernandez, Professor Rosalia Solorzano, who I believe is upstairs, Marjorie Yongo, Diana Rep, and Dean Suzanne Desjardin and Vice President Yura Brimage. So thank you very, very much. <laughs> and as we close, we have some gifts for our panelists. So the first gifts we want to present, uh, Yura Br Dr. Yura Brimage and Suzanne Desjardin, if you would come up, are for our student panelists. Each of them is receiving one of Dr. Rosalba Aida Hernandez's books. Uh, and they are getting some Pima swag. <laughs> the next uh, gift of appreciation we'd like to present is to uh, Dr. Raquel Rubio Goldsmith, our honoree for tonight. Thank you so much, Raquel, for lending your name to, to our event. Thank you. And finally, our uh, deep appreciation to Dr. Rosalba Aida Hernandez Castillo. I really want to thank Francisca and all the professors, the dean of uh, Pima College. I felt. Um, I was thinking when we were there eating the tamales and we were talking that uh, the last time that I had a book lounge that where I felt so at home and with the family was when I present my book in Ensenada and my uncles, my aunts, my cousins were in Ensenada and they cook and we have a big party. So I felt like I was at home and I'm Thank really you. thankful Thank for you. your welcoming. Thank, Thank you. you. And there's more food upstairs. There's still food. So if you'd like to eat, get a book mingle please join us upstairs thank you